In this video, we're going to explain the 120 years mentioned in Genesis 6-3 in context. What's up everyone, Dane Allen here. Welcome to In Context, the channel that's all about helping you better understand the Bible in its proper context. Welcome back to part two of our two-part series looking at Genesis 6-3 with a particular focus on the 120 years mentioned in the text. If you haven't already seen part one where I exposed an incorrect way of reading Genesis 6-3, now is the time to go back and check that video out. Here's the link to part one. As I mentioned, part one was about debunking a form of view I once held regarding this passage. That view being that Genesis 6-3 is talking about human lifespans being limited to 120 years old. But now with this video, I'd like to show you the view that I currently hold and why I think it's the correct reading of the text. I'll conclude this video with why this is so important, along with personal applications that you can take along with you. So stay tuned till the end. And now, to the text. Genesis 6-3 says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. My current understanding of this verse is that God is not capping human lifespans, but is declaring that he will destroy the earth with the flood in 120 years. In other words, this verse is talking about a countdown. We've already established in part one that this reference to 120 years cannot be talking about human lifespans because this would be contradicted by many examples in scripture and by present experience. If this is talking about a 120 year countdown, and I believe it is, then when did the countdown start and end? What's the math? Do the numbers make sense? I think they do, and the Bible gives us enough information to work with in order to back up this interpretation. To explain this, we're going to work backwards a little bit, and I've put together some charts, so I hope that's helpful for you if you're like me and like to see visuals. Okay, we are told that when the flood came, Noah was 600 years old. So, if Noah was 600 years old at the time God sent the flood, and the flood was being delayed for 120 years, then we should be able to work our way back to the start of the countdown, which begins in Genesis 6-3. Now, math was never my strong suit, but I think I can manage basic subtraction. Hey, did you get those numbers yet? So if that's the case, Noah would have been 480 years old at the time God declared, nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. The question then becomes whether God initially told Noah this, or was he thinking to himself? God declared this judgment three times within this chapter. The first time is in Genesis 6-3, but it isn't specified as to whether God was talking to Noah, and the details of the judgment aren't mentioned. Just the allusion to the Spirit of God interacting with the world in some way, and that God would not do this forever but he would give the human race 120 years. That's a D-A-P, by the way. A Dan Allen paraphrase. Then later in Genesis 6, 13 and 17, we see the second and third time God declares judgment. And here, we are specifically told that God directly speaks to Noah with specific details of what the judgment is. A flood that will destroy the earth and everything on it that has breath. In other words, all human life and land animals. We've already established that this is not talking about lifespans, and with this new information about the coming flood, the only logical alternative for the 120 years is destruction, which fits the context of chapter 6, the flood, and God's use of the phrase, the end of all flesh, which is another way of saying, you're as good as dead. That's another DAP. But since we know for sure that God spoke directly to Noah the second and third time he declares judgment on the world, how old was Noah at that time? Let's look at verses 13 through 18. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. God then proceeds to give instructions of how to build the ark, and then in verse 17, God says to Noah, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. And verse 18 is important here. But I will establish my covenant with you, 
and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Verse 18 is helpful because it lets us know that Noah's sons were already married. How does this help us? Because in Genesis chapter 5, verse 32, we are informed that Noah was 500 years old when he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which means that his sons would need to have been old enough at the time God is talking to Noah to have already been married. I think it is a reasonable guesstimate that they were at least somewhere around 20 years old. If that's the case, this would give us about 80 years until the flood comes. If God declared the judgment initially in 6-3, and this was when Noah was 480, and now God is saying that the end of all flesh has come before me, many years have gone by, possibly 40 years, and the flood is much nearer now than when it was first declared. So in a very real sense, the end of all flesh had come before God because the judgment was so much closer. So this is our working timeline. The question now becomes, what was Noah doing at the time God declared the judgment in Genesis 6-3, when Noah was 480 years old? Was he aware the judgment was coming? Did God speak to Noah concerning the judgment? Was he just going about his business and living his life as the rest of humanity? Some important details we should know about Noah are that he was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Okay, so this is an impressive statement that should cause all Christians, myself included, to stop and think, would God say this about me? Now, we know that Noah wasn't perfect, especially since we see what happens in his life after the flood. But I sure would like to have the testimony that says, I was a righteous man, blameless in my time. Dane Allen walked with God. I hope each of you are desiring that too. But Noah was a believer who was walking in fellowship with God. Blameless in his time doesn't mean sinless. For we know that all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But blameless simply means without blame. In other words, though Noah, like the rest of us, was a sinner, he evidently wasn't living in a way that was requiring the discipline of God. Noah was not living in known or willful sin. This is why we see the phrase, in his time, because by contrast, the rest of the world was living in open rebellion against God, which is the reason for this extreme judgment. Another important detail about Noah. We are also informed from the New Testament in 2 Peter 2.5 that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So Noah wasn't some yehu wasting his life away without any purpose. He was trying to witness to others. Based on this information gathered in the timeline and these descriptions of Noah, we have at least two possible interpretations that fit the context of this passage. Possibility number one. When Noah was 400 years old, he was informed that judgment, in general, was coming in 120 years. During this time, he was preaching righteousness to his generation. Then, 20 years later, at the age of 500 years old, Noah became the father of three sons, and by the time they were old enough to have wives, God spoke to Noah again concerning the coming judgment. Only this time, God now informs Noah of the details of the judgment and commands him to prepare so that he and his family will at least be spared. So the amount of time spent building the ark could be somewhere around 80 years if his sons were about 20 years old when married since Noah's sons and their wives were mentioned when God spoke to Noah in verses 13 through 18, and Noah is recorded as being 600 years old at the time of entering the ark, seven days before the flood came upon the earth. Okay, so that's a possible interpretation that doesn't seem to have any conflicts with the context. Possibility number two, Noah was not informed of the judgment that was coming when God started the 120-year countdown, but was walking in fellowship with God and preaching righteousness in general to the world around him. Though Noah may not have been informed of this specific worldwide judgment that was coming, he may well have understood that the wages of sin is death, and the more one willingly sins, the more likely they are to bring upon themselves the righteous judgment of God, which can result in premature death. And perhaps he was reaching out to individuals or groups of people in general, as all believers ought to be witnessing to the world. But during this time, God was giving humanity time to repent or to stop their wickedness, in order that his judgment may either be delayed or stopped altogether under the preaching of Noah. However, as the clock began to run down over the years, God directly informs Noah, sometime when he was older than 500 years old, that he is going to send a flood to judge the world, and that Noah needs to build an ark for himself, his family, and enough animals to repopulate the earth. Talk about a minor task. It is at this time that Noah's general witnessing ends, and he begins his specific preaching of righteousness ministry regarding the coming flood while also preparing the ark for several decades. It's officially confirmed to Noah that, yes, people are about to reap what they've been sowing, which is a world full of violence, 
Their simple wages are going to be paid in death unless they get on board with believing Noah's message and literally get on board the ark with him. Because the only safe place to be is where God said to be, in this case, a giant wooden boat. So that's the two possibilities of the view I hold to and think you should too. This view says that the 120 years is not talking about lifespans, but is referring to a countdown until judgment. This view which says that the 120 years is not talking about human lifespans, but is referring to a countdown until judgment, fits the context and is not contradicted within the Bible. Of the two possibilities we mentioned of this view, I tend to lean towards possibility number two, that Noah was not informed the first time God mentions judgment in Genesis 6-3, mainly because the text doesn't say that God was speaking to Noah. I think this could be a similar situation like when God was speaking to himself within the Trinity as he was about to create humanity in his image and likeness, or before going down to the people building the Tower of Babel. I think that's what's going on here, but both possibilities can work within the context without any issues. So that's the 120 years of Genesis 6-3 in context. Here's one final question for you to consider, and then we'll get into application. So what? Why is understanding something like this important? Isn't it kind of trivial? Does it really matter? Oh, hey, before I explain why this is so important, I want to say thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying this video so far, press the like button down below so that I know you've benefited from it. That also lets YouTube know that people are interested in these videos. It's a way that you can be a part of what I'm doing by helping get these videos in front of the eyes of others. Thank you so much, and now, back to the video. There are multiple reasons why this is and should be considered important to us. Number one, as Christians, we should be pursuing an accurate understanding of God's word. If we're not pursuing an accurate understanding, the alternative is not good. Number two, to be able to defend what we believe when skeptics attempt to discredit the Bible. If we don't have an accurate understanding of the Bible in its proper context, it does damage to us and our witness to others. For example, Skeptics love when people hold the first view of Genesis 6-3 we discussed in part 1 because it is easily proven wrong both by human experience and explicitly in the scriptures themselves. I realize that none of us have a perfectly complete understanding of the Bible, but as point number 1 says, we should be pursuing an accurate understanding, always running back to the Bible to better understand God, ourselves, and what God has thought so important to have written down for us. And number 3, Misunderstanding this verse does damage to the patience of God being displayed in this passage. Genesis 6 is most famous for judgment that God sends upon the world, but many people who misunderstand this verse miss the fact that this chapter screams of God's patience and long-suffering for a sinful world that he does not want to judge. Think about it. Why delay the judgment? Why tell Noah to build this massive boat to take all the animals and his family on a survival cruise? God created the entire universe by speaking. Surely he didn't have to have Noah build an ark. He could have instantly destroyed everyone except Noah and his family. Or he could have instantly prepared the ark for Noah. Why go through all these hoops? I think God was doing many things in waiting for 120 years. Number one, he was delaying judgment in the same way he's delaying judgment today. To give more people more time to repent so that either more people could be delivered from physical death or that judgment could be stopped altogether. Number two, God was displaying his great grace and patience. Given the description of how bad things had gotten in the world in those days, and then to read what is said in Genesis 6-3, nevertheless his days shall be 120 years, God is giving these people that deserve instantaneous judgment 120 years to reconsider the way that they are living and to stop their wicked ways. God did not want to judge them. And number three, God was preparing this judgment in a way that would paint a picture of warning for future generations about the future judgment that is coming, not of water, but of fire, that they may learn from the mistakes of the past and live. Only this time, he hasn't given us 120 years, but it has been a couple thousand years since Jesus ascended into heaven and is still patiently and graciously extending more time as each day passes by so that more people have the opportunity to live. He's not looking forward to that day any more than he was looking forward to the day of the flood. But when the countdown ended, the flood was sent. We are never specifically told that Noah knew anything about God's countdown or how many years he had left to complete the ark. But Noah believed the word of God concerning judgment and preached to a world that could have escaped the wrath of God if they too would have believed the message. We don't know God's countdown this time either. With every day that judgment is delayed, we should be amazed at the grace God displays to a sinful world and we should also realize that we are one day closer to that countdown running out. Time for application. 
What can we as Christians take away from these verses? Application number one, praise God for his long suffering and gracious patience towards sinners. It can be easy to slip into being annoyed that it seems like God isn't doing anything about the evils in the world. But if you're a Christian, I'm sure you're glad that God waited long enough for you to believe the saving message of John 3.16. I know I am. Yeah, I know. To us, it's been taking a long time, and we're used to Amazon two-day delivery, and we want what we want yesterday. But God isn't limited by time, and his priorities are much different than ours. Application number two. Proclaim the message God has entrusted to us. Noah was informed of a terrifying message that judgment was coming, but he didn't keep quiet. He was a preacher of righteousness. He didn't spend all his time building the ark. He was trying to call out to a world for decades, even though they ultimately refused to listen. In application number three, prepare for what's coming. When Noah received word from God, he got the business building. If he didn't, he and his family would have ended up like the rest of the world. He knew the importance and the urgency of obeying God. Similarly, Christians should see the importance of obeying God and seeing the urgency of being found faithful when he returns. Not for fear of losing one's eternal salvation, like some people wrongly suggest, because that can't happen. But what can and will happen for a lot of believers is loss of eternal reward and the approval of Christ saying, well done, good and faithful servant, at the judgment seat of Christ. Now that's a sobering thought, and it's one of those motivations that should get us in gear because just like the countdown of the flood in Noah's day, the unknowable countdown of Christ's return for the church is running out with each passing day. I hope this video has blessed you and caused you to think about some things. Let me know in the comments what kind of videos you'd like to see in the future. I have an ever-growing list, but I want to hear what y'all are interested in so that I can better serve you. Thanks again for taking the time out of your day to watch this. Here's some other videos you may be interested in on my channel. That's it for this video. As always, when reading your Bible, remember to keep it in context.